Hello, and welcome to an introduction to CCAT 7, the Canadian Cognitive Abilities Test, 7th edition. Today, we're going to take some time to do a brief overview of CCAT Form 7, focusing specifically on why it's used and how it's used in school boards. We're going to talk about some issues regarding practice and validity, as well as do an introduction to the scoring and reporting piece so that you know how to interpret results once they've become accessible to you. CCAT 7 has been available in Canada since the 1960s and has been sold by Nelson the entire time. CCAT, as I mentioned, is the Canadian Cognitive Abilities Test. It is a Canadian adaptation of COGAT, the Cognitive Abilities Test, published by Riverside Insights. CCAT 7 is the latest edition, complete with new design and updated items. There is improved continuity between levels and a reduced overlap of items, which means that when you need to, you can test students in concurrent years. We have an elimination of uh, oral language demands at the lower levels of the test. This is particularly important when we have ELL learners and we are trying to understand their cognitive abilities. And we have a higher standard age score ceiling raised from 150 to 160. This is particularly important for the school boards that are using this as part of their gifted or talented selection tool. CCAT measures reasoning skills. It measures a student's ability to process information and understand their learning. Things like comprehending problem situ situations, creating and adapting their problem solving strategies, using familiar concepts and skills in new contexts, making inferences and deductions or categorizing and classifying objects, events, or other information. These are all the skills that we know are keys to success in learning. The format of CCAT has remained unchanged. It is three batteries, verbal, quantitative, and nonverbal. Each battery is divided into three subtests. Each subtest is 10 minutes in length. This verbal, quantitative, and nonverbal is designed to give an overall understanding of the cognitive profile of an individual. The selection of these three batteries is based on the Cattell, Horn, and Carroll, or CHC theory of cognitive abilities. This is a multi-intelligence theory of cognitive uh, processing and cognitive abilities. Essentially, we're breaking things down into fluid abilities and crystallized abilities. The fluid abilities, the capacity to process information and acquire knowledge, and the crystallized ability, that information which we've acquired through experience. We're putting these two things together to understand the student's learning. Although it's difficult to express the validity it, it simply in a number, one of the things that we do know about CCAT is it measures developed reasoning skills in three domains or symbol systems. The important word there is developed. We know that intelligence, as we previously understood it and measured it, is, is not true. It is not a stagnant number. It can change. And we know that there are many things that influence our ability to learn and understand. So when we're selecting children for special programs, particularly gifted programs, we know that at certain points in their educational journey, they may not qualify, but at a different point, they may, uh, particularly students who may be new to Canada, who may have been out of school for a period of time uh, due to illness or other things going on in their lives. We know that this provides us with an alternative perspective for understanding their academic achievement as well. We know that when students are underachieving, perhaps it's a lack of stimulation. We know that we want to understand who students are and how they best learn. So CCAT provides us with some evidence of their cognitive ability that we can use both as a selection tool and to understand students who may need additional intervention. 
Appropriate uses of CCAT uh, is an important piece in understanding what it can tell you and how you should use it. You will notice about halfway down the list, we have identified students for academically talented programs. And I will assure you that in Canada, that is the primary use of CCAT in a historical perspective. Over recent years with the, the new addition and the ability to really dive into a cognitive ability profile for each student, that last line has become much more important. Help students and their parents make appropriate educational decisions. That's key. So whether we're using this as a selection tool and parents are using this information to understand if their student will thrive or benefit in a gifted program, or whether we're using it a, a more broadly based to understand who our students are and where we may have ability achievement gaps. Beyond that, we can use this information in the classroom to guide efforts to adapt their instruction, to understand their cognitive strengths and weaknesses, and to identify students whose predicted achievement is discrepant from what we think their potential uh, is. That's a really key piece when we're trying to understand students who may need more comprehensive educational assessments. One of the pieces about CCAT across Canada is you will find the majority of the administration is in grade three, four, or five. Occasionally, we do have school boards and we do encourage school boards to use this again in grade seven or eight as part of their high school planning program. Helps understand what pathways students might thrive in. But the majority of the use, particularly when it's being used as a gifted and talented selection program, is in grade three, four, or five. One of the things that we do stress is using it below grade three has some risks. The younger a child is, the more difficult it is to differentiate between their knowledge and their cognitive ability. The line there is quite blurred. So we do encourage school boards that grade three, four, five is your ideal window. And again, grade seven and eight, if you're using this as a pathway planning program. The other thing to keep in mind is for those school boards who are using it as a gifted and talented selection tool, the, the stricter and the more rigid your cutoff is, the more likely you are to have students who will might potentially fall off that as they grow older or as they transition through the educational system. So that's an important piece in terms of understanding whether you want to retest at a later point. Once you get your score or your results, students fall into one of nine stainines in terms of their overall composite score. We have well below average, below average, average, above average, and well above average. 50% of our population will fall in the fourth to sixth stainine, which is that average score. When we talk about using this as a selection tool, we're talking about students in the ninth stainine. And as a general rule within the school boards, we're talking about the top 2%. The ninth day nine is actually the top 4% of the population. And we're talking about just 2% of those. That's a really important piece when you're understanding who students are. So when we're talking about our selection tool, we're talking about a very small number. Within that small number, however, students still have a profile. Regardless of what stay nine a student falls in, and again, even if they fall in the ninth stay nine, they are also assigned a profile shape. A student with a 9A profile, as an example, means the student's scores are consistent across all three batteries. That is a student who has strong, or exceptionally strong in this case, cognitive abilities across all three batteries. Theoretically, we would then expect that their academic achievement would be fairly consistent across all subject areas. Keeping in mind, a student can have an A profile in any stay nine. You can also have a student who ha falls in the second stay nine. So they are well below average, but they are consistent across all areas and the interventions they will need will be across all areas of their learning. The second profile shape is a B profile one score above or below the others. So in terms of a student potentially um, in your gifted and talented selection process, they may have their quantitative and nonverbal battery in the ninth stay nine, 
and their verbal battery in the 8th stay 9. Obviously, an 8th stay 9 student is still above average, but what it is telling you is their verbal reasoning skills are not in keeping with their quantitative and nonverbal reasoning skills. Certainly, when we think about people we know in the community and people we've worked with and gone to school with in our, in our lives, we can think of those people who are much stronger with math and visual than they are with language. Obviously, this student um, is going to benefit from some support in that language so that they can truly express their understanding. But when you're thinking about selection into a gifted and talented program or a specialty program, you need to understand what the impact of that verbal battery may be. The third profile is a contrast profile, a C profile. That means that there is contrast between all of their batteries. So they have, in this case, a relative strength and a relative weakness. Keep in mind the important word there is relative. So as I mentioned with our previous student, they can have two batteries in the ninth stay nine and one in the eighth. That eighth stay nine is a relative weakness. Obviously, compared to the general population, they're still quite strong relative to their other batteries. It's a weakness. But you can have a student who actually falls into three batteries. This becomes really important when you're using this as a selection tool. Perhaps you have a student who stores in the ninth stay nine in their quantitative battery and actually has a very high standard age score. But perhaps their verbal battery is in their seventh stay nine and their nonverbal battery is in the eighth stay nine. In all likelihood, based on criteria that are used across most school boards, this student is not going to meet criteria for a general uh, gifted, talented, or enrichment program. But this student is going to need enrichment and support in that quantitative reasoning battery. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So even your students who don't meet criteria, you're gaining information about them that you can use to support them in their mainstream classroom. The other shift that's taking place across most of uh, Canada right now is we're not having as many contained gifted programs and we're having more of the enrichment opportunities or, or um, enrichment classes, this is times when you can look at maybe you have the drop in and drop out piece. Maybe you have selective opportunities and that's going to help your student. The student who was likely to need the most support and is going to have the most difficulty is a student with an E profile. This is a student who has 24 IQ like points or standard age score points, one and a half standard deviations between at least two of their batteries. It is not uncommon to see a student who may have the quantitative and nonverbal battery in the ninth stay nine and their verbal battery as low as the fifth or sixth stay nine. Um, that is a student who is going to need a lot of support and enrichment to keep that quantitative and nonverbal piece uh, alive and engaged. Their verbal battery in that case may be average. Uh, you, questions that you will want to dig into is, is this student an English language learner? Is there a language processing piece? How to understand the impact that this may be having on their academic achievement in some areas. So even our students who we are selecting or who may miss, just miss criteria for a gifted and talented program, the profile is the next piece that's going to give you the information. And as I mentioned, we can have relative strengths or relative weaknesses in any of these batteries. Um, they are indicated in the profile V negative or V positive, relative weakness, relative strength. But keep in mind it is relative. The more extreme it is, the more significant it is going to be in terms of your planning and your decision-making process. A student can have all their scores in the eighth and ninth stay nine and still have relative strengths and relative weaknesses. In fact, based on the standard age score, having a range in the ninth stay nine of 134 to 160, it is possible for a student to have all their scores in the ninth stay nine and still have a relative weakness, a relative strength, sorry. Um, that's an important piece to keep in mind. When we raised that ceiling from 150 to 160, what became apparent is those students approach things differently, those students learn things differently, and those students have different understandings. So even a student who has all their scores in the ninth stay nine 
can still have that relative strength that is going to have a significant impact on how you approach their learning and their understanding. That's a high level view of what CCAT is and, and focusing on how it is used in terms of selection tool for gifted and talented. It's also important to know that those students who don't meet criteria, you're still gaining a lot of information about them that you will be able to use back in the classroom. If you have any further questions about any of this, please feel free to visit our website at nelson.com or send us an email at nelson.clinical at nelson.com. And thank you for your time. <laughs>